Autumn Lane McClure was a 16-year-old girl living with her grandmother in Ormond Beach, Florida. She was studying at Mainland High School. On May 10th, 2004, Autumn's grandmother called the sheriff's office to report her missing after she didn't return home that day. Autumn was last seen with her boyfriend. Police questioned the boyfriend, who told them that he had dropped Autumn off at the Volusia Mall and had not seen her since. A search was launched for the missing teenager, but nothing turned up. Sometime afterward, Autumn's grandmother told detectives that Autumn had called her from a different area code, and she had received some letters from Autumn postmarked from Melbourne, Florida, claiming that she was okay and would return home after she turned 18. The case went quiet, but a while later, detectives received information that Autumn was staying at a house with two people. Brian Donnelly and Jessica Freeman. When detectives went to the couple's home, they said that Autumn had stayed with them for a few days and then left. They said that they were co-workers of Autumn's at the Winn-Dixie supermarket. They told detectives that Autumn did not get along with her grandmother and that they had allowed her to stay in their trailer for a couple of days but did not know anything else. The case then went cold. However, detectives continued working, obtaining DNA from family members and entering it into a national database for missing children. The case remained cold until 12 years later, when detectives again contacted the boyfriend. This time, Autumn's boyfriend claimed that he had lied to them about dropping her off at the Volusia Mall. He said that he had actually dropped her off at the Seabreeze Bridge, where she had then gotten into a car with Jessica Freeman. Detectives tracked down Jessica, who was now living in Nevada. She claimed she did not know anything about Autumn's disappearance. Detectives caught a break when a tipster told police that both Freeman and Donnelly were involved in Autumn's disappearance. The police questioned Freeman again, who this time asked for immunity in exchange for her answering questions. Freeman told detectives that she had worked with Autumn and that she and Donnelly allowed her to stay with them at her trailer. Freeman said that she had been in a sexual relationship with the couple. Freeman told investigators that one day she returned home to see Donnelly allegedly choking Autumn in the bathroom. She recalls that she was unable to save Autumn and that she left the trailer where the three had lived. When she returned two weeks later and inquired about what had happened to Autumn, Donnelly allegedly told her, shut up or the same thing will happen to you. Over the years, Donnelly allegedly told Freeman several times about how he had, quote, cut Autumn up and buried her. She said that she did not know where Donnelly had buried her body. But in late 2023, Freeman told authorities that she believes Autumn's body was buried beneath the trailer as Donnelly had expressed satisfaction at the fact that new concrete had been poured on the site. Using ground-penetrating radar, authorities searched the surface. They found spots of different density than the surrounding soil. Subsequently, authorities worked with the new owner of the trailer on the property to excavate the remains. In February of 2024, authorities recovered what they say is 99.9% .9 of Autumn's remains. These were taken to the medical examiner to confirm her identification. Despite Autumn's remains finally being found, Donnelly could not be charged as he had died in 2022. In May of 1974, Connecticut State Police received a tip about two murders that had occurred at a home on Shoeville Road in Ledyard, Connecticut. Investigators searched the house and the surrounding area. They soon found decomposed bodies of a man and a woman in two shallow graves several hundred feet behind the house. The man would later be identified as convicted serial bank robber Gustavos Lee Carmichael, who had escaped from custody. He had committed multiple bank robberies across the nation, and in 1970, he was apprehended for the theft of $60,000 from a bank in New Jersey. Additionally, throughout his lifetime, he faced convictions for various offenses, such as burglary, kidnapping, attempted burglary, grand larceny, assault and battery, and armed robbery. However, in October of 1970, during his transfer from a Massachusetts jail to a federal court in Hartford, Connecticut, 
He and another inmate managed to escape custody, prompting the FBI to issue a federal warrant for his arrest. While on the run, he would eventually meet a woman and they began to go by the names Dirk and Lorraine Stahl. They were staying at the home of Richard De Freitas and Donald Brandt, fellow bank robbers. De Freitas and Brandt possessed several safe houses utilized to harbor fugitives evading law enforcement. Nonetheless, the woman, Lorraine Stahl, confided in De Freitas' wife that she was afraid of the lifestyle they were leading. When De Freitas learned about her fears, he told Brandt, and they decided to eliminate Carmichael and the woman, fearing that her potential capture could lead to the exposure of their illicit operations. Given the perceived difficulty of eliminating just the woman without Carmichael's likely intervention, they opted to murder Carmichael as well. Investigators believed Carmichael and the woman were killed on December 31st, 1970, four years before being found. De Freitas and Brandt fatally shot Carmichael and the woman, then dumped their bodies, which remained undiscovered for more than three years. Richard De Freitas and Donald Brandt were eventually convicted of the murders and have since died. Even though the man was identified, the woman who was shot was never given a name, as she'd used an alias that was never verified. Before going by the name of Lorraine Stahl, she was known to use the names Connie and Sandy, and was known to drive around in a 1964 green Oldsmobile with either Massachusetts or Maine plates. The car was eventually found dumped in Hartford with a Maine registration sticker on the license plate. She was also known to have possibly worked in New York City. After the bodies were discovered, police found clothes and jewelry with the woman's remains, including a tan leather, quote, wet look vest, a gold or tan sweater, a brown tweed skirt, and a brown pair of so-called granny boots. She was also wearing a pendant and various rings, according to the state police. She had on her a class ring, which had the letters J-H-S-N inscribed on it, alongside the initials I-L-N and the year 1917. Lorraine Stahl would go unidentified for 50 years. Her case was entered into the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System in 2011 and CODIS in 2012, but she remained unidentified. Then, in 2022, DNA samples were sent to Orthrum Labs, and they were able to build a DNA profile of the victim. In January of 2024, the profile helped to find a connection with the victim's sister. They also found out that the victim had a daughter, and she provided DNA samples. Soon, Lorraine Stahl was identified as Linda Sue Childers. Childers was born September 4, 1946, and was originally from Louisville, Kentucky. Her sister and daughter were notified of her identification, and the case was considered solved after more than 50 years. Kellyanne Workman was a 24-year-old woman living with her parents in Douglas County, Missouri. Described as quiet, independent, and determined, she was the daughter of dairy farmers and often helped on the farm. To make extra money, she provided lawn care and maintenance services, often completing house and yard work for people in the Dogwood area. On June 30th, 1989, Kelly was mowing the grass at Dogwood Cemetery, adjoining the Pleasant Southern Baptist Church. Kelly was meticulous about her work, clipping along the rows of headstones before using trimmers to cut the individual stray blades from around each marker. She began her work at 3.30 p.m., and at around 5 p.m., it started raining, so Kelly went home to feed the calves while her parents milked the cows at their rented Seymour farm. When the rain stopped at 5.40, Kelly was back at the cemetery. Her uncle saw her mowing as he drove past the lot on Missouri 14 in Douglas County. This was the last time Kelly was ever seen alive. 20 minutes later, with less than half of the job completed, it appears that Kelly left the mower beside a tombstone and disappeared from the cemetery. When she failed to return home for dinner later that night, her parents became worried and reported her missing to the police. 
However, police told her parents to wait as they suggested Kelly might have run away. Her parents vehemently disagreed as Kelly was dependable and would not have left her work unfinished, nor would she have left her tools simply sitting out in the cemetery. Her parents and friends organized their own searches and soon, despite suggesting that Kelly had run away, the police launched their own countywide search in and around Douglas. Kelly's 1986 Oldsmobile was soon found in the church connected to the cemetery's parking lot with its key in the ignition. For several days, the search involved hundreds of volunteers, as well as scent tracking dogs and helicopters, which scoured the countryside. However, nothing would be found. Then, seven days later, on July 7th, a farmer and his son in nearby Christian County stumbled upon Kelly's remains submerged in water from the waist down. Her body was found about 10 miles from where she disappeared. She was found fully clothed, but so badly decomposed that it took dental records to identify her. How she died remains murky. Her death certificate merely lists, quote, homicidal violence. Authorities believe that Kelly was abducted from the cemetery with the motive of sexual assault. However, at the time, the autopsy stated she was not sexually assaulted. It was only more recently that investigators confirmed Kelly was indeed sexually assaulted. They say she probably died in the early hours of July 1st. However, due to the advanced state of decomposition, they could neither determine the time nor the cause of death. Kelly's mother, Joan Workman, believes she knows the exact moment Kelly died. She said that after reporting her daughter missing on July 1st at 3.30 a.m., as she sat on the living room couch and worried about Kelly with family and friends, she felt a surge of panic and pain in her chest. She says that she thought to herself, quote, hang on, Kelly, hang on. But then she says the feeling passed, leaving her, as she described, feeling dead inside. Kelly's body was interred at the Dogwood Cemetery, which she so lovingly helped maintain. Kelly's parents harbored frustration towards the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, feeling that had the police treated the case with the gravity it deserved from the onset, there might have been a chance to save Kelly. Their anger stemmed partially from the police's failure to dust Kelly's 1986 Oldsmobile Cutlass for fingerprints. Moreover, they expressed disappointment that crucial pieces of information, such as reports of a screaming woman, were overlooked amid the chaos of the initial night. A few months later, Kelly's mother learned that four days after Kelly's abduction, an anonymous caller reached out to her home, leaving a message with another family member regarding a sighting of someone at the Workman residence on the afternoon of the abduction. Surprisingly, the caller did not reach out to any law enforcement agencies involved in the investigation. Joan believes that her daughter might have known her abductor or abductors. A reward of $10,000 was offered. Police questioned several suspects over the years, but no one was ever charged. There were two suspects who were repeatedly questioned in Kelly's murder, Dwight and Bobby Banks. Dwight and Bobby Banks were two brothers who had been pulled over by a Missouri Highway Patrol officer in 1990 as they were traveling down the highway in a pickup truck on the night of Kelly's disappearance. It is unclear why they were initially suspected in Kelly's murder, but Dwight Banks was asked by police to take a polygraph test regarding the murder, and he agreed to take it. He reportedly passed the test. A few years later, Dwight, alongside his brother, Bobby, again became suspects after Dwight reportedly confessed to several people that he murdered Kelly. In a 1995 article from the Springfield News Leader, it was reported that Dwight had confessed multiple times to killing Kelly. However, he later asserted that these confessions were made in jest, attributing them to him being under the influence of alcohol at the time. Dwight admitted that he and Bobby saw Kelly just a few hours before she was abducted, when she had been working, but he said he did not kill her. Dwight Banks added that his brother, Bobby, is also innocent. At the time of Kelly's disappearance, Dwight Banks told the news leader that he and Bobby were at his house eating fried chicken. 
However, the newspaper, the news leader, also reported that authorities have been told that Dwight Banks may have taken drugs before the 1990 polygraph examination, which he had passed. Later, Dwight's brother, Bobby, asked an ex-girlfriend of his to provide an alibi for him for the evening Kelly went missing, which she later reported to police. It was reported that Bobby Banks failed the polygraph test which Dwight Banks attributed to his brother's frail emotions. Nine years later, the Missouri Highway Patrol Crime Lab issued a warrant for two men, one of which was Dwight, seeking DNA evidence allegedly connecting him to the killing. However, the test did not yield any conclusive findings. On February 20th, 2024, authorities said at a news conference that three men had been arrested and indicted on charges of first-degree murder, along with charges of forcible rape and first-degree kidnapping. The three men were identified as Wiley Belt and the initial suspects, brothers Dwight Banks and Bobby Banks. Investigators say the case was cracked wide open by an eyewitness, someone brave in the community who had come forward, giving them evidence they needed to take the case to a grand jury. All three men were in their mid-60s at the time of their arrest. Currently, the Banks brothers, alongside Belt, are being held at the Douglas County Jail in Ava. Each is remanded on a $250,000 cash bond. If you like what we do and want to see more, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much to our patrons. If you would like to support this channel, you can visit the link in our bio below.